Ach so, okay. Ich habe Right. <laughs> Finally, I'm now also just to let you know I have a list of everybody's name after the Liam Lewis debacle yesterday. So I won't get that wrong anymore. Right. Um, okay. So this one, we're not, I'm not going to bother too much with um, any of this uh, with the question reduction back from this time. This one, this one. Um, with the questions from um, that we're talking about yesterday. So forget the, the pros and cons of gamification and all this sort of stuff. I expect that you'll probably know this, or hopefully you will. Uh, by the time it's your um, exam. Um, so let's just go straight onto this because we want to go. Well, we don't want to be until seven. I'm hoping. Um, so the thing that for all of this, the thing that the, the thing that you need to think about is all of these design principles are great, but what happens? How do you know that they're correct? How do you know that they're right? How do you know that it's, that what we've been saying and what we've been what I've been teaching you is actually not just a pile of crap? Um, and the way to do that, or that when you've actually encoded these, or captured these design principles in your code base, that you know that they're really there, that you're not just kidding yourself. Okay? So the way that we do it is by evaluation. Um, and before we do or enact evaluation methodologies, then you need to know something about, well, it's a bit more complicated than just saying we're going to run an evaluation that's going to be think aloud say, which is many evaluation types, and then it's all going to be great. Okay, so there's some things you need to think about, about how you choose your, your participants, how you choose the sample size, how do you do that, um, what does it mean, what kind of statistical techniques will you be able to use on the data that you've collected afterwards, and that kind of thing. Okay? So it's all, it's all necessary to think about before you start. So, the thing here is that is exactly this, badly designed equals incorrect analysis. So if you, if you don't design your evaluations correctly, then your analysis is going to be incorrect. Now, this might be okay, maybe it's okay, um, sort of, if all you want to do is do your work and get paid. But for the company, it's going to cost them a load of money in the end. Okay? So, it's not, so it's best to take your time with this. Incorrect analysis e equals incorrect conclusions. So if you've got an incorrect analysis, then obviously the conclusions that you can draw about whether this kind of work is going to be okay or not is not going to be, um, you're not going to be able to draw correct conclusions. Okay? Which means that the success of your intervention is in doubt. So when I say intervention, I mean the piece of software, the artifact, the device, the thing that you've created that's got all these um, usability, accessibility, emotional uh, and engagement sort of principles captured within it, and it supposedly represents what the users really want because you've done your, um, you've done your uh, requirements capture at the start. All of that is in doubt, okay, if this doesn't work. If you don't, especially if this is designed badly, if your studies are designed badly. So that means that generally everything I've taught you up to yet if this isn't done right, isn't worth crap. Okay, you can forget about it all. It makes it, it, there's no point in doing it. Okay, so the reason why it's there is so that it helps us to focus our mind, or the principles to focus our mind. But the, the key thing is this: your evaluation. So really, in the most extreme circumstance, you can decide I'm going to do. I'm not going to do any principles. I've forgotten all of those. I'm not going to do any user testing at the start. All I'm going to do is evaluation. And that, companies do. You know, they just do the evaluation, because all they're bothered about is, are, is, do people like it? Will people come and you know, look at our work? Um, will people use the interface properly? Will they have a good experience? That's all they're bothered about. So everything else could go away, theoretically. The point is that by doing um, the initial work with users, by encoding the principles, then what we do by, na by the very nature is reduce the possibility of getting our evaluation our evaluations wrong. Because the where the money, where it costs money, is the number of times you do you have to do the evaluation. Yeah? So that's the problem. If you have to do the evaluation a lot, it's going to cost more and more money. So all you want to do is just do the evaluation once and it turns out that the that the system's great. 
but it might not be the case. Okay? So that's what the principles and the, the principles are for. That's what the formative user studies are for. It's just so that we can make sure that we don't have to go through this loop very much. Okay. So who knows anything about science? Being computer scientists, who knows anything about science? It's a method, the scientific method, that's a good one. Okay, any more? Do we know anything more about it? It's awesome. It's awesome. It is awesome. That's very true. It's excellent. Yes? I need an explanation to what we see around it. Yeah, I mean, what we're trying to do is in some ways create um, a model. I, I think of it as this, I and mean, other people can see it differently, but I think of it as like a model of, the, of, the surround, of everything, okay, in the end. So therefore, is it, does it matter that that model is exactly, exactly accurate? Um, it kind of doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't, because, I mean, think about the way that we model light. It, you know, it has properties of particles and properties of waves. Does it matter whether those two things shouldn't coexist together, but they do in light, so does that matter? Well, the answer is probably not. It doesn't matter that much, as long as it allows us to understand the phenomenon better, okay, and to predict that phenomenon better, yeah? So that's the thing that we're looking at. Now, there's ways that we can do this, and this is the main one that you are going to be using for most of the stuff, inductive reasoning. So this evaluates um, and then applies a general, uh, to a general population. So this is statistical analysis. So we evaluate something in a sample, and we apply it saying that these things in this sample are correct over the, old, over the whole population. And the way that we know that we write is statistical significance, okay, theoretically. However, there's other kinds of reasoning, deductive reasoning. So who's done stuff like um, description logics? How many of you have done the DL stuff, description logic stuff? Okay, so with Bijan Parzio and Hugo Sattler and those kind of, yeah? Well, for those people who have, you've got this, this, this deductive reasoning. So therefore, we say, evaluate a set of premises which, we, which then necessitate a conclusion. Okay? So therefore, we say, herbivores only eat plant matter. All vegetables contain only plant matter, therefore all cows must be herbivores. Yeah, because that's the definition. Okay? Therefore, vegetables are a suitable source, food source for cows. But uh, the conclusion must be um, provided that the premises are true. So therefore, if one of those premises is incorrect, everything else is possibly incorrect. Yeah? Um, I mean, they do an excellent one. Has anybody done the um, the one with cows, the, the mad cow ontology? Do you do that one? No, where they talk about uh, so in there in the reasoning there they have this. Uh, it's called an ontology, um, and it generally says that obviously cows are vegetarians, um, are herbivores, herbivores are vegetarians, whatever, and then obviously when but in the cow feed it's it it's got meat, so therefore generally. Does it, it comes up saying, oh, we shouldn't be doing this. There's a big kind of uh, error in the axiom due to the fact that, you know, you're not supposed to do it. Cows are vegetarian, so why are you feeding them meat? You know, so obviously they're not vegetarian if they're eating cow food, uh, processed cow food that's got meat in it, which is the main cause of BSA. Yeah. So that's the kind of deliberate reasoning that we're getting with this. Now, the point is that you'll normally find that this one is more about empirical science. So stuff that you're going to do. Experimental work, yeah, and these ones are more about um, mathematical reasoning, reasoning in a in, in, um, in a sort of a theoretical way. Yeah. So, to be scientific, a method of inquiry must be based on the generating of observable, empirical, and measurable data, well, evidence, and be subject to specific principles of reasoning, which is obviously what we've got this inductive reasoning. So, do you all know that? You all know that this is this is the scientific method, yeah. Good, because a lot of sci a lot of computer scientists I speak to, they don't know that, okay. So they because mainly in computer science we're looking at engineering. It's really a lot of it is computer engineering. We're building stuff. We're not looking at stuff that was created, okay. Now, um, bizarrely, in the old days, natural science, natural science was called science, but things like engineering, etc., was called art, okay, because art was everything that was created by man, 
and science was the investigation of everything that was created by God. Yeah, that's the uh, that's that's the way it was originally conceived. Yeah, bits wrong, but that. until it split up. So this is this is the scientific bedrock that we're going to work on, and that all your empirical investigations and when I say empirical investigations, what I'm actually meaning is your evaluations are going to be centred around. Yeah. So the evaluations that you're going to be doing, or that you should be doing, are all based upon this idea. Now, even when those evaluation methodologies have come from other domains like um, social science or anthropology, the idea is, especially with social science, that there is some scientific rigour to it. That's why it's now not called sociology so much called social science because they want to have this scientific rigour. Okay. Now, a lot of the times the re research methods you're using for these kind of um, activities and for the activities that you're going to be doing as um, UXers is probably not that quantitative, it's quite qualitative. Okay. Small <coughs> sets of data, small participant groups. Okay. It's not going to be massive. Um, it's also going to be something whereby you're going to get some bias because you're asking people questions, you're observing people and they know that you're observing them. So therefore that's going to be a, also a problem you need to um, you know, overcome. With most sort of sciences like physics and chemistry, you're not, you're, it's about observing, experiments are about observing. Whereas in a lot of the social sciences, experiments are about asking people something or getting them to do tasks in psychology and then measuring those tasks. But you're still there in the middle of the system. And so there's various um, checks and balances that are put in place to make sure that we try not to, um, that we try to keep the scientific rigour high, even though it's quite difficult. Okay. So, generally we see some notes. Scientific method, which is really, um, I mean it's a simplistic view of it, but there we are. We've got, um, we start off theoretically with hypotheses, okay? And then we get procedures and experiments that we're going to do, in this case, evaluations for you guys. So your hypotheses, well, what might a hypothesis be for a UXer? If you've, you've created a system, what might a hypothesis be? Yes? This system is easier to use than the current one. This system is easier to use than the current one. Keep those words in mind. This system is easier to use than the current one. That's good. Okay, next. Any more? Any more? I know it's five o'clock, but sure. Yeah. Is this the system that you user expected? Okay, so is this the system that user expected? That's another one. Okay, any more? Any more? Okay. So then, <coughs> we do something, and from it we get data. Okay, we get results. We do the analysis, and we get the conclusions. Now in some cases, it's, it's a method called grounded theory. We don't start off with the hypothesis directly. We just go into the procedures. We have an idea. We go into procedure experiments, we do data, and then we let the findings dictate the hypotheses, which is a lot of scientists don't like. Okay? But it does happen. But that's called grounded theory. Yes? But you start with an idea, so that's then a hypothesis, isn't it? You're preconceiving something. Not. No, because we'll see about hypothesis in a sec. The idea might be, I want to investigate how people... Um, I want to investigate um, people if people are sick online. You know, if being, going online makes people ill. But it's not a hypothesis; it's just a general direction. You don't know, you're not saying it does make them ill. It doesn't make them ill. You know, saying how it makes them ill. What the you're not quantifying it in a particular way. Yeah. Okay, so that's the general scientific method. But for us, good science or at least hardcore science, we start off with these, and it comes around in this way. Yeah, I'll start up with hypotheses. Okay. So, an inductive example. First, we create a hypothesis which, in the best case, cannot be otherwise interpreted and is refutable. So, who who talked about this refutability? First of all. Okay, so it's a guy called Karl Popper. Yeah, so he he talked about refutable. Now, let's think about these two discussion. These two. Um, um, Hypotheses have just been uh, proposed here. So the first one was, what was your hypothesis? Okay, so how can you refute, how is that testable? How do you test easier? So we, so the next one, yes? Is this a system that user expected? Right, how do you test 
expectation. So these things are called weak hypotheses because it's very easy to make them mean whatever you like. Yeah? Now if you said a, a user will find this system, I mean you'd have to rephrase it, but if you may put a quantification in there to say that, that users would rate in a questionnaire after using these two systems, this one, higher by 3%. 4%, 5%, 10%, okay? then you'd have a harder, a stronger hypothesis. But something that you could, hypotheses can be very small, but they must be testable so that they can be refuted. If we can't refute them, then we've got no solid building blocks for the scientific method. And what's more, if we can't refute them, then we don't learn anything. Because all we do is confirm, confirm what we want to already know. Yeah? So that's what we're thinking about here. So, does anybody know about um, black swans? No? So, in the world, long time ago, you know, there's a flash of knowledge there. Do you know about black swans? No, 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 no. Okay, so, in, a long time ago, everybody thought we would travel the world and we encountered swans, and the swans were white, okay? Swans were white, and they're always white. You go, swans are white, yeah? So, that seemed to be absolutely certain, because it was observable. Yeah? Um, we amassed many observations. Okay? <coughs> Swans must also be able to must be refuted. So if the hypothesis remains intact, it must be correct. So what we tried to do is go to lots of different locations to see what the colour of swans were. And we went to the Americas, we went to Europe, we went to lots of different continents, and we found that in all cases, swans were white. However, when we got to Australia, we found they were black. Okay? Swans were black in Australia, or are black in Australia. Yeah? Or a certain, a certain type of swan is. So this is exactly what we're talking about with the scientific method. Okay? It's very important to have something that you can refute. Yeah? So we said, so swans are white, that's refutable, because it's a swan. That we know what the colour white is, it's white. As soon as that doesn't occur anymore, we know it's been, easy, it's been refuted. Yeah? But what we try to do is make many, many, many observations, and in those observations we're not trying to pile on, um, what we we're not trying to pile on, um, sort of, we're not trying to prove that swans are white. What we're trying to do is part of observations that disprove swans are white. Okay? In all science, you're trying to break the hypothesis. Yeah? That's the idea of it. Okay. Now, there's been, there's been many debates regarding the question of whether inductive reasoning leads to truth. Okay. So, it's very difficult to say, because in this case, up in the amount of knowledge that we had about white swans was such that, generally, we thought, yes, this is true, okay? It's proved, swans are white, but it wasn't, just because we've not had the number of observations. And what we know with science is that we only need one observation to refute the, the um, inductive reasoning. We can have as many as we like, we, we only need one, one to refute it. We can have them. So that means that if we've got a hypothesis that we want to destroy, and we can't destroy it, then we, can, we can't say it's proved. All we can say is it's supported. If it turns out, if, we, if we've got a hypothesis which we then disprove just once, we can say it's been disproved. But we can't test every case. Okay? That's very difficult to do in empirical work. Okay. So, we can make some inductive leaps if they're based on good science. So you guys, that's why we use statistical analysis, will be able to make some good leaps in your evaluations for UX. If you do good science. But if you do bad science, it won't mean anything. Yeah. Their leaps may not be absolutely accurate, as we've said. We're just trying to have a model. May will assist us in our understanding. In the UX, they domain we use mathematics. Okay, so that's pretty much what we're going to do. We're going to use statistical analysis for all of this. Now, what we 
we're trying to do, and it's very difficult in UX, is to generalise to a population. So in this generalisability to a population, we have got a small sample, because we can't look at the entire population, and so we have a small sample and we try to generalise to that population, okay, to the, to the wider population. So that means that the sample size, the sample that we're going to take, has to be representative of the population. Yeah? Wake up. <laughs> okay. So what we're trying to do here is enable us to use a mathematically generalizable um, generalizable to a population, which is called external validity. Okay? So external validity is the thing that says that all the actual statistical analysis for this work is externally valid. If it's not, if we don't have a, if we have a bad sample, we don't have enough people, it's called internal internal validity. We're trying to make sure that that the internal data for all of those people is cohesive. Okay, for all of the experiments is cohesive. That's called internal validity. Yes. How can we like how can we be certain though that our sample is representative of um, all population? Okay, we're going to come to that in a minute. Yeah, that's a good good question. We'll get to that. Yeah. Okay, so as we've said, and you know, you'll see that there's questions on this. Not no hundred percent certainty because statistical analysis doesn't give us that. Okay, so what we have is confidence. Now I'm going to get onto statistics in a bit more detail uh, in a few, well, in two logical weeks, if you like. So after Easter, two weeks. And so what we want to talk about is that we have a level of confidence in statistics, but that, that might be incorrect. And it certainly might be very incorrect if we've chosen, if we haven't chosen a representative sample, um, or if we've done the design wrong. Okay? So, when somebody says, this is statistically significant, that's, I'm, going to tell you, I'm going to keep telling you this until you believe me. Um, it's not that there is a significance so when we're looking at statistical significance, what, what people often think is, in their, when they visualise it, they, they visualise it some way as like some kind of graph, whereby we have a little, whereby we have two data sets, one here and one here, and we say, oh, yeah, that's, that's significantly different from this one, is significantly different from this one. Is that what you understand significance, statistical significance to be? That the significance... We've got this big difference. Yeah? Reality is that's not the case. What is the case? The significance only says that. Let me think how I can phrase this to be best. It says that we are confident that all these samples and the differences between them is not due to random chance. Okay? So. You could have a set of samples like this. And we can say that this set is different to that set and that that is not by random chance. And we say we have a st statistical significance, or people will say, to a significance of 0.05 or 0.01. Okay. Now this is called the p-value when it's enacted. So when it, when you've actually run this through a statistical test, it's called the p-value. But actually, it's the alpha value before. So these are alpha values until we've run the statistical test. Then they become p-values. Okay. So the p-value might be 0.056, but we're aiming for an alpha value of 0.05. The p-value might be 0.21, but we're looking for an alpha value of 0.01. Because this says we're 99% sure, and this says we're 95% sure. That these things haven't occurred from due to random chance. Not that this is any more significant to the other. To talk about significance here, we have to look at the effect size, and that's called a beta value. Okay, so exactly the same as this, but it's a B value, beta value, and it's normally about 80%, but you don't know. You don't know, it's, it's variable. So for instance, Something that's significant has an effect size. Now, if you say this is a significant effect, it might be if, if significant to some, but not significant to others. Yes, please. Um, how do you measure this random chance 
do you like quantify in some way? Yes, so, yes, yes, um, and, and I'll get to that in the stats. I'm glad you asked. See, people like stats, it's good. So what we're going to do in stats, there's a thing called inductive reason. Uh, so it's, 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 um, okay. So there's inferential statistics, in sti in sti descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. The inferential statistics, and some of the descriptive ones, but mainly the inferential ones, allows us, allow us to get these p-values out. Okay? So the statistical tests will give us these p-values, and, and we, we decide what alpha value we want to match. Yeah? So if we say we're looking for an alpha value before the test of 0 0.05, because we think that's the best representation of it, then we're looking for p-values of less than 0 0.05. Now we might say we're looking for an alpha value of 0 0.06 or 7, because we are, because we feel like it, because there's some reason. What you'll find is people blindly follow these two. They blindly follow them mainly because they're idiots, okay, and they don't know, don't understand statistical analysis. So 0 0.05 is what is commonly held to be um, a good figure, a good figure in social science. 0 0.01 similarly, okay. So statistical analysis, they have good, these two good figures, 0 0.05, 0 0.01. But some people will really go crazy if you have anything. A great, greater than 0 0.01. Yeah? So, we'll get to that statistics. But all of this must be, all of this only works, it only works if you've done the design right. If you don't do the design right and you don't use the correct statistical um, test from the design, you could have a, a, a p value of 0 0.001 and it won't make it any more right or not. Okay, we'll also get into, at that time, things called type 1 and type 2 errors. So type 1 and type 2 errors are where the p-value, mainly for type 1 errors, where the p-value is too constrictive. Okay, and that means that we get errors as well. So all of this, if somebody says, oh, it's got to be 0 0.05, it's got to be 0 0.01, blah, 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 and don't give any rationale for that, then you need to start questioning why. Why has it got to be all that? How did you come up with the, these are the correct alpha <coughs> values? Why, did, why are you aiming for that alpha value? Yeah? Okay. But it's all based on this correct design. Okay, so let's have a look at the kind of variables that we can expect to see in a, um, in a test, in a, not in a test, in an experiment. Okay? So first, behavioural. So we have this behavioural variable, and that's equated to the user. Okay, so the behavioural variable is all about the user. In user experience, this is. The stimulus is the interface or the computer system. So the stimulus might be um, some kind of test that you've decided, some task that you've decided. That's the stimulus. The observable response, it's the thing that we're going to observe to measure. So in some cases, that might be task completion time. In other cases, it might be galvanic skin response. Okay? And then we've got the subject. Now, this word I'm going to tell you in a minute. It's, I'm using this term here because it's a term that most people use, but it's, it should be participant. Okay? Subject is a really terrible word to be using, and we'll see why later. Okay? We'll come to ethics. But these are factors such as age, weight, gender, to see whether there are any, these are kind of descriptive facts about the person, to see whether there's any reason why that might be the case. Okay? Do they have good eyesight? Or bad eyesight, for instance, is that why is that why there's a problem? There's um, some difference. Okay, and what you can use, you can you can then start to test whether these things have an effect. Does weight, not weight, does eyesight have an effect on, say, somebody doing a task on a computer screen that's too far away? It's likely to, but what and how can we quantify that effect? Now, do you remember back in the BBC lecture where they were looking at the different the distance? that the TV screen should be for the different font sizes. Yeah? So that, in that case, then they're, they're doing exactly, exactly this. They're measuring to make sure that somebody's vision is, what about, you know, is there, an, is there an amount where somebody's got 20-20 vision and that's okay, or do you have to vary that based on their vision, what vision they have, the size of the font that is. So that would be, we'd be able to find that out from understanding the subjective factors, the subject factors. 
Yes. How many categories do you actually look at within the main categories uh, uh, of the, of a sort of participant? Because there's so many variables that dictate uh, yeah. rather than just oh, just being this age group, you would do this or it likely to happen. How many do you expertise? You have to decide, and that's why it can also be wrong. But yeah, you have to decide. Um, I mean, you, there are people who take main ones like age, weight, <coughs> gender, whether they um, uh, whether say maybe if they're doing. If they're doing reading tests, whether English is their first language, say, or whether the language of the interface is their first language, because that might slow people down. Um, yeah, if they're social, where, they're, where are they from socially? Now, what you will then see is you can throw all these subject factors into, well, SPSS or one of these statistical packages, and you can come out to see whether you can start to play with the data then in the analysis stage to see whether there's anything that seems to look like it's to do with. Um, Social upbringing, or eyesight, or age, or gender. Yeah? That kind of thing. So, collecting these is a really good thing. I was at an ethics meeting today, uh, the Senate Ethics Committee, and we were looking at one, um, one ethic, ethics proposal, and where, where the science said it wasn't, was, I thought it was pretty reasonable, but people wanted, wondered why the experimenter was taking these subject variables, lots of subject variables. There's always a a toss-up between how many subject values you take and why you're taking them. I think take more, the more the better, because that way you get, you know, you never know what you're going to, in real science, you never know what, what's going to be a factor. Yeah. Well, other people don't. They see it as a, um, they see it negatively, because why should the person tell you all these things, you know, so you're, you're kind of breaking their ethics, if you like, the human rights. Okay. So then we have these, we have these two things. Independent and dependent variables. Dep independent variables is the thing we manipulate, and we want that thing to be. We don't want many independent variables. Okay. The, the, small, the lower number of these independent variables, the better. Because if you've got lots of independent variables, you're not quite sure after a time what the independent variable is that's the problem. Okay. What's more, if you do for every normally for every independent variable, you have to have another set of participants. Okay, so you'll see these studies which are sort of um, studies of 10 to, to the 2 to the 2, which means that generally you have, it, it just means that the number of participants you need to, to put through just goes up massively. So try to keep these independent variables down. Dependent variables is the thing that we measure. So we can measure lots of stuff. We can measure heart rate at the same time and we can measure galvanic skin response. We can measure gaze, that kind of thing. So we can do that a lot. Okay? Okay. So, we're up to this point. We've got way more to go, but I'm conscious I'm just talking and there's lots of data here. So, are you all feeling alright? You're all intelligent people. This is all by the numbers, right? It's kind of good. Yeah. It's worthy, but dull. But, it's not that dull for me, because I quite like this stuff. So, how do we measure these dependent variables? So we have a number of scales. So all of these, all of these, just like we have loads of jargon in computer science, we have loads of jargon when it comes to these kind of experimental work in HCI. So well, I'm telling you these because you, if you work for in a UX company or for a UX um, department, they'll be talking to you in this kind of language. They'll be saying, "Oh, I'm an independent variable. A variable you got." What are your dependent variables going to be? Yeah? What subject data are you taking? Okay? They'll say, what scale are we using to measure your dependent variables? Because this dictates the statistical test that you're going to enact. Okay? So, nominal scale, that's the worst. Yeah? Because it's just about names. It doesn't say anything. Ordinal scale, a bit better, because it's got magnitude. Interval scale, it's also denotes identity and magnitude and is equal intervals. So this ordinal scale could be logarithmic. Yeah? And then the ratio scale, which has true zero point, which is most like a real number. So this is the this is the gold standard. And this one here, these ones here go increasingly worse. We can know less the more we go up. Yeah? What we normally get for a lot of these is so, for instance, we can have things like um, this interval scale. 
So we've got the identity, the magnitude, and its equal integral. So for instance, on a thing called a Likert scale, then you've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So, and it says good or bad. You've probably done these on course evaluation questionnaires and stuff like that. Yeah, so all those things. So that's why they're choosing it. Because it denotes identity in some way that they're saying good is 1 or bad is 1 and good is 5. And then they say it's got magnitude because it's going 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay? And they're equal intervals because we know that 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 are equal intervals. Yes? So what exactly uh, do we mean by identity in this case? <coughs> okay, so the identity aspect is that you know that one side, that good is on, so, so here's the identity I'm show you. So if you've just got the scale, so if you've got something which is, okay, so let's do this, let's do this standard scale. So we have excellent, good, um, okay, bad, terrible. So this one is nominal, it just denotes identity. Good, uh, excellent, good, okay, bad, terrible. We don't know what those things are. We just know that this one is excellent and that one's terrible, but we don't know how much more bad is from terrible. We just know it's bad and terrible. But how big is the distance between bad and terrible? How distance is the between, bigger, bigger distance is there between okay and bad? Or okay and good? Or okay and excellent? We don't know. Yeah? So that's the first thing. We've got this nominal scale. Okay, now the ordinal scale is better because it denotes magnitude. So therefore, we've got something where we can say that we've got very good, very bad. Okay, and we can see that because we've got magnitude, because we've got uh, magnitude, we can say this is five, and this. Uh, oh, actually, let's just say. We've got 2, 1, 0, 3, for instance. Okay, so here we can kind of see, well, what we can see is that we've got, this is, this is, this is confusing me, it's confusing me. 1, 2, 3, 6, 8. Okay, so here we've got 1, 2, 3, 6, 8. Now numbers, we can see this has got magnitude, 1 is smaller than 8. Okay, but the intervals we've got between them denote different things. So this interval says 1 and 2, but this interval denotes 6 and 8. So therefore, it's not equal. Yeah, we don't have equal intervals. So it could be anything, we don't know. It just could be. So then, if we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, then we've got equal intervals. Yeah? But when would you ever want an unequal interval? Oh, because you might want to decide that actually there's more weight that goes on the, uh, goes on the um, bad ones than there are the good ones. Or why don't you just present to the, to the subject, or participant, uh, an even scale, and then you can do your own translation afterwards? That's a good point. You actually, you, most of the time, that's exactly what we do. We definitely do the, we do the translation afterwards. But in some cases, for some statistical tests, that doesn't work. So, for instance, you might not be using... I'm using numbers here to denote magnitude, but you could have other things that could, that could denote, donate, denote magnitude. So you could have, um, oh. so here we've got very good, and then we've got kind of good, and then we've got even. So, so if you had words, <coughs> To, to denote this, you see that they, <coughs> that they can denote magnitude because it's about height, you know, very, kind of, even, because it makes it more friendly to a user. But it doesn't tell you whether the, whether these are the same, okay? It doesn't tell you whether the interval is the same, even though it might look like it, yeah? Or you could have, you could have good, you could have good and bad, and let, or good and less good, even. I've seen strange ones where it's not, it's not so polarised, where, where at this point we're going from good and we're going, from, we're going to bad, which is on one side of an, equals, of an equal point. But you can have ones which um, 
are not doing that, where we've got, we've got ones which are just going a graduated scale. Okay? Well, that graduated scale might be uh, logarithmic. Yeah? So then you've got the one at the bottom, where you've got very good, very bad. Okay? So this way, you've got this zero point. Yeah? Now also, with this ratio scale, you can also have um, numbers that just stretch. So you've got zero, but you can have numbers that are way bigger than one, two, one, two, you know, minus one, minus two. Yeah, because it's got a zero point in it. So you know where the fixed zero point is. So you know that this is exactly zero. You know that this is two. Ooh, that's going to be around, isn't it? Okay. Like that. Yeah? Two, one, yeah, zero, yeah it should be two, one, zero. <laughs> it's late. I've been here since five, four. Yes? Can you have the mixture of the intervals to, uh, for, for the endpoints? Yeah, but you can't mix the, you can, but you can't mix the statistical test for which you're applying, on, in which you're applying them. So therefore, if you take a series of data that's like this, then the statistical tests that you're going to use are going to be different to the statistical tests you're going to use if you're just going to take, if you're going to do this ordinal scale or the nominal scale. Yeah? I'll give you some examples of these because I've got a whole book on um, various questionnaire based approaches they use in NASA, etc. You know, we've got the Likert scale, but then there's the thing called the NASA bipolar scale. So okay, so this is to measure various uh, aspects of um, flight in you know, flight stuff in NASA. Okay? You might need lots more information because you've got speed in there or something like this. Yeah? Same for time to task. If you've got task time and you're, uh, you're actually uh, measuring somebody, then obviously you're measuring them in seconds. So therefore, you want, you've got a fixed zero point and then you've got seconds. So it's not all about questionnaires, even though that's what I'm trying to show you on here because it makes it kind of, well, it was supposed to make it easier. But you can, you can, uh, you can um, obviously you can use you know, timing. And that's, so therefore, that's going to be on this ratio scale. Yeah, because it's got a fixed zero point. Yeah. There's something like a heartbeat kind of stuff. How technically you got a true zero, but you wouldn't want to see that in the test. So you well, you wouldn't want, want to see it, but you might do. But you can see, but the thing is, the zero, you don't want to see it necessarily. But what you do want to know is how distant you are from this fixed point, from zero, which is dead, pretty much. Or no beat, so unless you're that guy, you're that footballer guy, you know, it? Wasn't beating for two minutes, two hours on his own. Wow. So here, you know, it, we can measure then how critical that was by how many beats was happening. Yeah. So that's what you're trying to measure the distance, so that you can see there's a proper starting point. Okay. Now, the important. Okay. I think we've seen this. So, hypothesis testing, you've got two, times of, two kinds of hypotheses really. You've got the null hypothesis and the hypothesis. The null hypothesis just says it's the same as normal. Okay? Everything's the same as normal. It's just, there's no change. It's, this is the same as the population out there. Yeah? But, there's no difference between the two. But the hypothesis says there is a difference. Okay? So what we often start off with is this null hypothesis. We say there, there's no difference, and we're testing for there to be no difference. We want there to be no difference. And it's only when there is a difference can we say that that's strong and supported. Yeah. Okay, coming up. Okay, yeah. strong and weak, I think we spoke about already. Nothing is ever proved, as I think we've also said. So hypotheses are supported or disproved, but not ever proved in empirical work. Okay? You can never prove a hypothesis because you never know you've tested every single case, every possible case. Yeah? So we should almost know that. When anybody says, oh, uh, I proved this hypothesis, if it's not some kind of theoretical proof, uh, uh, proof, then they haven't. There's no way you can prove it because you don't know that you've done it. And actually, it's actually, I mean, that's really bad. You often find it when people are trying to say, uh, science is better than re re religion because science doesn't rely on belief. Well, it doesn't, but it also can't prove a hypothesis. Yeah? It can only support it by the fact that you're trying to break it 
You're trying to give it test cases, you're trying to break it, and it doesn't break. But you don't know you've given it every single test case. Yeah? Okay. <coughs> do we want to do this or do we want to just plow on through? Plow, 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 plow. Yeah, you're just trying to get to the pub, aren't you? You're right. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, I can't, I've got to, I've got to, I'm, this week I'm, I'm running on Saturday, I've got to. I no, have no beer. Mm -hmm. Don't care. <laughs> um, okay, so let's move on. So we've got evaluation design analysis. So we've got experimental design. So the, the design of the experiment has got to do with, as I keep saying, and I'm going to say it again, the number of the participants you've got, the number of participants, how you've collected those participants, how you run the test itself, how you design the tests themselves. Okay? That's, that's all about the experimental design because it also feeds into the analysis. So how can you ana analyze this? Okay? In, in statistical analysis, we've got parametric and non-parametric tests based on how likely the information is to follow a standard distribution. Yeah? Those things all need to go into your understanding of the evaluation design because you need to make sure that you've taken these things into account. Now, in some ways, this could have been done at the end of all the other work because I'm introducing concepts that you that I've not actually been through yet. But it'll all come together in the end. But you would this is the logical sequence that you would do things. So if you know how to do these tests, of course you do the evaluation design first. And in fact, the ethical um, application that you're gonna that you're gonna probably have to put in in most companies um, will require you to do the evaluation design. Okay, to start with, before you've done any work at all. Yeah? Okay, data collection and tools. I'm hoping, actually, I'm just babbling on, but I'm hoping I've not got a slide there that tells me about data collection. Okay, so data collection and tools. So, so how are you going to collect this, this data? So there might be lots of ways you can collect it. There's lots of um, screen capture so software that you can use okay, to, collect, to co uh, collect time to task and see what people are doing. Okay? There's lots of stuff that you can use for qualitative work, such as um, MVivo for coding or various different um, uh, tools that allow you to upload audio files or video files and so that then you can annotate them with what people are doing. Yeah? Um, we're working currently on a data set um, well, I'm not working on, well, we are working on the data set, I'm not allowed to see it, but it's a uh, data set of people with lung cancer. And they interviewed 31 people and 17 clinicians, and, the number of, and they came back with transcripts of 1,700 pages. So there's a lot of data there to analyse. Okay? What's more, it should, for every hour that you video, it, it'll normally take you to transcribe and code it about 10. Eight, between 8 and 10. Okay? That's, the, that's the standard. Because you have to keep going back over and listening to what they're saying and writing everything down and thinking about what that means as you go through. It's quite a long, long task. But it does mean that you know the data inside out. Okay? Okay. So, data analysis. Now, in qualitative work, qual, we use data analysis tools which are really very much prevalent in, the, in, in um, anthropology, okay, in sociology. So these tools are exactly like this. They're kind of tools which may be like sort of more diary-based tools. They might the tools which are more word-based, and so you have to go through and highlight categories. Do you know in, uh, I don't know if you've done, have you done that stuff where you highlight nouns in, um, to get functional requirements in software engineering? You get to, yeah, you highlight the nouns. It's kind of like that, but you're not looking for just nouns, you're looking for concepts. But then, and then you look for how many times those concepts run through other systems, okay? Not other systems, other participants. Yeah, so you can see the magnitude of the times those concepts are important. But of course, the problem with it is you have to decide on what concepts you're starting to highlight. So you have to go back through this process lots and lots <coughs> to make sure that you give all of the emergent terms a fair chance. Okay? Okay, but mostly... It happens through in quantitative work through statistical analysis, as we've said. Okay. And we have these two kinds of uh, statistics, descriptive statistics and inferential statistics. 
Descriptive statistics tells us, allows us to describe the data set itself. Okay? Just the data you've collected. Now that data could be an entire population. So I could say, if I gave you a questionnaire about this course, I could theoretically say that um, all you guys were the, were the population. And so therefore, I don't need to generalise anything. There's no inference required because my statistics represent the population, are the population. And therefore, they're not called statistics anymore, they're called parameters. Okay? So, you know, so if, if, if my set, if my population is the same as my sample, then it's not a sample anymore, it's not statistics, it's just parameters. Okay? If my um, set is a subset of the population, then it's statistics. But what you want to do from that is say, well, I've done my work here, say for instance on the 20 people that you've got looking at your product, and then you want to say, but actually, these 20 people are a representative sample of everybody else in the world. Okay? And all these other people in the world will then love our product. They'll find it as easy to use. What you're trying to say is that the 20 people you've looked at are an indicator that everybody else who uses the product will have the same user experience as these guys. Yeah? Or you need to change things. That's what you're trying to say. But you can't test everybody, theoretically. So what we look for is internal validity, which goes with descriptive statistics, and external validity, which goes with um, inferential statistics. Is the validity of the data internally, is the, is the data structure, is the statistical data structure itself <coughs> valid internally? Okay? Or... And then, is it externally valid? Can it be generalised okay, to this inferential set? Can it be generalised? We use inferential, in, inferen, uh, inferential statistics, internal validity, descriptive statistics. And we have this other thing called confounding variables. Confounding variables are very important, and you'll hear lots of, uh, uh, lots of um, Psychologists and cognitive scientists talk about confounding variables and they'll say to you, oh, well, what kind of confounding variables did you get? I don't know. What you're trying to do with confounding variables is cut down the number of variables that will have an impact on your statistical analysis. You're trying to cut the, cut the likelihood that they will happen down. That's why we're doing the evaluation design. Yeah? So the way that we try to cut down these confounding variables is to minimise the number of independent variables that we're testing for one that we make sure that the um, experimenter doesn't um, bias the subject, bias the trial. Yeah? That's why we might have um, trials where we've got um, double-blind or triple-blind trials. Now, I've mentioned these before, so who's going to tell me what a double-blind trial is? Yes? double-blind trial is where the subject and the... The participants. Yes, the participants and the, um, and the tester doesn't know what the desired outcome is, and the triple-blind is where the participant, the tester, and the analyst doesn't know what the... Uh, very good. Yeah. That's very good. Okay, so that means we can make sure that there's no experimental bias. Yeah? Okay. So that cuts down some of the confo possible confounding variables. But you might have other confounding variables, which you're also trying, by taking the um, subject data, I'm calling it subject, but it, could be called, it shouldn't be called participant data, but by taking, taking the subject information, then what we say is that we can cut down, we can understand if there are any confounding variables there, because maybe a confounding variable is language. Maybe a confounding variable is height. We don't know, but we'll soon know that if there seems to be some other thing going on in the wider set, and people who are over eight foot tall, or six foot tall, are, uh, you know, don't exhibit the same traits as the people in the main set. Okay? So we can say, this might, why is that then a confounding variable? Okay. okay, so let's look at the kind of sampling we're going to do, or you might want to do. You won't, probably won't do any of these <coughs> in your UX career unless you go to do sort of hardcore, more science-based stuff, okay? Or you're working for a cool company that's got you know, resources, yeah? And want to know something scientific. scientific. Okay, so simple random sampling. So, so, don't read this, but what do we think simple random sampling means? Don't read that. Don't read that. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, you, maybe. maybe just, just pick anyone. Just, 
I mean, it's what I'm assuming means. So okay. Pick just, anyone. Just go around and just as they're walking around, just pick up. Okay. <laughs> you might. That's that's kind of right. Well, it's not. It's not right. I know what you're saying. But anyway, yes. Yeah, I was going to say some things. So like, <laughs> someone's in the street with a clipboard, and they used to get random passes by in an area, and they do that around. Right. Just to get kind of random stuff. Okay. That's that, so. You two are about the same. Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um. Yeah. Get. Use uh, I've read this line, but <laughs> I don't understand why it's why it's in the wrong. But they kind of kind of wrong. We get something to choose that has no bias. Can't it's not can't see what the people are. So it's something randomly generated number. Yes. Something that will randomly pick it. So it has when you pick one, it has a difference when you pick the next one. Yeah. It has nothing to do with the actual participants that will be chosen. Yes, that's exactly right. The reason why your the ones that you talked about is called quota based sampling. It's often used with people in the street because it's convenient. There's also a thing called convenience sampling, but I don't know. <laughs> but why do we think your way of doing it isn't as rigorous as this way of doing it? Even though it seems, you know, you're randomly going, oh, that person, that person, that person. Okay. <laughs> yeah? Well, I guess this is probably the default sort of Say, oh, he looks approachable, like the person. So I guess you are kind of biased in that. But, yeah. You know. What do you think? Yeah, because we're going to be more attracted to certain people. So. Yeah. I was just going to say you, you, you'd avoid certain people. Like if, if someone's walking down the street looking pretty angry, you are not going to react to anything. Yes. <laughs> so yes. Like <laughs> Like I typically walk down the street, see some like, like clipboard a mile away. And know that as I get kind of slightly to steer off the way. <laughs> yeah. So people who don't want to be in the survey won't be in it. Yes, that's true. And so when these these quota based samplings, I mean so quota based sampling in some way was it was was trying to get around some of that as well because of its this convenience on the but so the reason why it's different is, is exactly for these reasons. It's been shown that um, through actual observation, proper observation and tests that um, People who are out on the street with clipboards, if you're a woman, you'll approach men over 50 more, more often than you'll approach anybody else. <laughs> and if you're a man on the street with a clipboard, you'll approach women under 30 more than anybody else. <laughs> okay? Secondly, if you want to go, uh, if you're just on the street, if you're going to go around houses, canvas houses, you always pick the ones on the lower floors of the apartment blocks. You don't pick anybody on the top floors because that's more time, more work. Um, you don't pick houses with big fences around them and barking dogs. <laughs> These kind of things, they seem obvious, but then therefore your sample is not random anymore. Okay? Okay, so so that's so this random sample you can think of as a it's like um, a load of balls in a bingo or a ball or something. Okay? And all that happens is that a ball pops up and you grab it, pretty much. Reality is it's a random number generator, which is you're exactly right. That's how we do, really do it. But it's, it's often useful to think of that. Now, the th now there's a, there is a technique called bootstrapping. Okay, and it's only good. Well, there's debate. Most people say it's only good for random samples. Other people say, who cares? Okay. But when you've not got enough people in your sample, you've only got 20 people that you're picking, and you want what you do is you have those 20 people and you get all the data from them. But then, when you're doing statistical tests, what you what you think of is this this bowl, this um, bingo ball bowl. You pick one out, and you take all the data from it, and then you throw it back in. So you don't pick it out and chuck it away. You pick it out and throw it back in. So then it's got another random chance of you picking it up. And you and then that means that with those 20 people, you might extrapolate it to 10,000 because you're, you're just picking 10,000 times, but it's the same stuff. If the sample's been chosen correctly, it works, kind of. Okay, so then you get a better statistical analysis because you can look at 10,000 people. It's called bootstrapping the sample. So, some people say it's only good for random samples. Other people say um, it's, you know, it's better for, that it, it, you can use it on um, other kinds of samples, like convenient samples. The other thing is that you won't ever see it in medicine. So, clinical samples, no way. Okay. So I was, we were doing some medical stuff today, and um, there was a sample with 800 participants and 200 base case participants. That's bloody great. 1,000 people, and it was a pilot. 
We're looking to do a pilot, you'll be looking to do a pilot in UX with five. Yeah? A thousand people on a pilot. And then oh, we're going to make it bigger. How many? Oh, you know, I don't know, 24,000. Huh? That's crazy. Yes? So, like, in terms of applying this, um, the random design thing to, like, a, a human being, for example, how would we make that work? Like, because I guess, you, I mean, yeah, how? Okay, so. In, so here's a case for you. In 1930s America, they did it by looking at the telephone directory and just looking at telephone, randomly picking telephone numbers. However, unfortunately, uh, only a subset of the population had telephones. So that's a problem. But you might choose social security number, national insurance number. You might choose any kind of numeric, you know, anything that uh, denotes um, a person via a number, say. Now, the other thing to think about is with all of this, is you've got then a set of non-respondents. So you have to keep the number of non-respondents, because the non-respondents might tell you something. If you're doing some work and only 20 people will respond, and you want 100 people to respond, why is only 20 responding? If it's about medical services, it's likely that the 20 who respond are the people who don't like it, or really like it. Another problem. So that's why you need to keep your non-responses. Yeah, if you if your non-responses are 10%, 20%, it looks like maybe lots of people are responding regardless of how they've had medical treatment. So you have to just keep that in mind. That's why we collect non-responses. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think the question I'm going to ask you might be a rhetorical question, but why do we need randomness? Uh, in, because when we are doing something, we have something in mind. Is a, 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 or the audience we're targeting towards. Uh, we're designing a system. Uh, okay, yeah. yes. So we don't want that something we have in mind to bias the results we get. No, um, that's the reason I just wanted to confirm that rather. Yeah, than yeah. I mean, that is the point. Yeah, we don't want. We, we're trying to reduce biases. Confi confounding variables is what we're trying to get rid of. Okay, but it's. Um, uh, we have to be. We have to be real about it. You know, generally, we might not be able to get a random sample of enough people. We might not. I mean, random, if people just put the phone down every time we uh, say, "Oh, can we do a questionnaire?" Then there's a problem. You know, that might happen. Um, so we have to be a bit more. Generally, in this data set, sorry, in this um, set of participants, simple random sampling, that's the best. But then we go down to system systematic, and we'll go down to the worst. But it's just levels of what we can get in some regard. Sometimes we just can't get it, okay? Um, just because people, you know, it's, it's way difficult to get this kind of data set. So a good random sample is difficult to get, yeah? Okay, so then we've got systematic. So what do we think systematic... Oh, oh nobody read that. Uh, you read it. <laughs> um, so, systematic, what do we think systematic is? Yeah, it's it's important to input in what we're going to follow to get the sampling. I mean, that's, that's what I see. There's a method in that. Okay. So that's one way of doing it. Any more? Any, well, any of these? Yes? Like uh, with the, the, the person on the clipboard on the street, you can be like, oh, I'm going to ask every tenth person that walks past me. So uh, that kind of, as long as the person sticks to it, it kind of removes their bias and it's, it's still... Yeah, it mitigates their bias. Yeah. That's right. and so that's what we're talking about. So generally, what you might do is, um, say for instance we were doing some work on um, uh, <coughs> website complexity, okay? And so we want to look at, we want to draw a sample. But how can we look at every single website? And is that going to be useful? Because, you know, if we just look at, if we just pick random IP addresses, uh, that relate to web addresses, then it's not going to be very, it might not be very useful because we're going to get lots of data in the long tail. Maybe we don't want that long tail data. So what we want to look at is say, oh, I don't know, Alexa top 500. But we don't want too much data, we don't want too little, we don't want it all clustered in some way because it's on a, it's on a usage scale. So we don't want everything clustered randomly, it could still be all clustered at the top. If, we're, if our sample is small enough, we want to pick 10. Theoretically, it could cluster right to the top. So, what we do is we do this um, systematic version where we say we'll pick every every we'll pick every tenth starting at five. So it's exactly that. But but you're picking normally from you're trying to reduce you you've got a you've got a focused population and you're trying to reduce the amount of uh, 
and you only want to pick a few samples, not loads, and you know that those samples might either be scattered or they might be all in one place. So the good thing, to, so the way to get a kind of a thin slice through the entire data set is to pick a stratified, or not stratified, a systematic version, way of doing it. Okay? So that's what this is, systematic sampling. Stratified sampling, so generally this means that this reduces, to reduce the normal sampling variation, okay? So, so this one means that we look at strat, uh, we look, a stratified sample would be something like University of Manchester students, okay? So we'd look and we'd say, how can we look at, so we want to just look, we want to generalise to the population of the University of Manchester, we, but we look at a stratified sample which would be people from computer science or people from whatever, humanities, English. But then we go to this multi-stage thing where we say we've got the University of Manchester, well that's not good enough. So what we then need is other different, not University of Manchester, we've got computer science people at the University of Manchester, and we've got, well that's not good enough. So what we need now is multi-stage. So we do the computer science people, but then we do English, and then we do physics. Which means that we've got these stratas, some are, so, some are science, some are not science, okay? But they're, all, they're not picked from the general population, they're picked from these groups that we've already picked out. Is any ordering in the multi-stage as well, that we do this one first? Well, the multi-stage one, you would normally just draw them by um, any of these other, by random, systematic sampling. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Stratified sampling is to get a more representative sample of the population. Yeah. So that if there's, say, uh, a thousand people doing English and only a hundred people doing uh, sports science or whatever. Yeah. So you're going to take more people from the English and less people from the sports science. That's right. So you're trying to represent. So for instance, it's the same with population demographics as well. Like for instance, you might want to take, you might want to make sure that your application, that, that you've got the correct demographics for age, say. Now we'll see that there's some non-probabilistic versions of this as well. but. So, so therefore you have a stratified sample to make sure that, that you've got people in, in uh, you know, sort of, um, people who are, the, the correct percentage of people who are old, who are over 80. So you make sure that in the population you know how many people are over 80 and then you make sure that you take a strata through them. Okay? Yes? Does the multi-stage um, sampling allow you to form some, some kind of hierarchy in terms of the samples that you've collected in any way? Not normally, no, because what you're trying to do is say that you take it from one location and then you say, well, that doesn't generalise because it's just it could be a factor about the University of Manchester. So we now need to take it about take Birmingham, and then we can say, oh, that might be, that might generalise to people to students in England. Then we might want to take another one from Edinburgh. That might be England and Scotland. I mean, you might need to do a few more, but that's the way that it works. So you can't all you can say about the University of Manchester is. The University of Manchester, students at the University of Manchester, that's, that would be the general intent, the idea. And then we go on to quota based sampling. So, quota based sampling is exactly as we talked about. What we're trying to do is replicate the, we're trying to replicate our understanding of what the population is. So, for instance, we're trying to say these people who are out on the street with a clipboard have been told to get 8%, you know, 16 men. 16 women and 14 men, because that represents the population of the age demo of the gender demographic. They're told to get, of those, they're told to get so many people between these age ranges and these age ranges to try and represent the population. Okay? <coughs> so they're doing it because it's more convenient for them to do it. It's very inconvenient to do it, to, and it's co more cost effective okay, for them to do it this way. Snowball sampling, let's see if I've gone to go slow, snowball sampling is really generally just like a snowball. So generally all that I'm doing is say, oh, you do you do my thing, and then you say, oh, my friend will do your thing, and then you say, my friend will do your thing, your test. So it's like a snowball rolling. Yeah? I roll and say you're going to do it, and then you suggest somebody or two people that, um, it's like a pyramid scheme. Pyramid scheme, it's like a pyramid scheme for, uh, for this kind of stuff, yeah. So do you see how that works, the snowball thing? It's very simple, and it, there's no rigour to it directly, it's just convenient. <coughs> yeah? In, in sort of sampling process, uh, what do we do about sample that we're actually missing out? Because in, in everything, you know, 
I'm just talking from a different point of view that, that there is a sample that we got or that we chose from a particular yeah. method, but there's potentially a <coughs> whole different sample that might be a totally different thing, you know, something from people who really don't want to be into the survey, so they change the way. Yeah. But they might actually have a right thing to say. Anyway, I don't know, I'm just looking yeah, at Yeah, no, I mean, that's very true. And so that's why the random, <coughs> the random uh, sampling is there. That's why the orbit has something there. Because you might go to a quota-based sampling and somebody says with your clipboard, no, go away. So you miss something, possibly. They might have some valuable and useful information, which is the way it works. There's nothing we can do about it. It just comes out in the statistical analysis. What we try and do is build the sample so big that we get rid of those effects. Okay, the bigger the sample, the more likely those effects are to disappear. Yeah? Snowball sampling. Convenient sampling. So this is just a so this is just a convenient sample. So I just say, <coughs> instead of I say, say to you, do my do my um, questionnaire and suggest somebody else will do it and you suggest and you suggest and you suggest. I just say, you four, you're do, you're gonna do it because you're convenient, you're do it. Yeah? So that's what I say. But if I'm on the street with a clipboard and I've got no uh, form telling me who to grab. I just grab anybody, the most convenient people who walk by who look alright. You're not going to kill me and don't have a big dog. Yeah, those kind of guys. That's it. And then, <coughs> oh, 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 judgmental sample. Then you just go, oh well, I think you look like the kind of person I want to sample. That's it. There's nothing, you know, I think this is a good sample. I think you'll make a good sample. So that's it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, Sometimes that bias might be alright because um, <coughs> it might be that you think I want to, I, you know, I'm looking for people who are into heavy metal. So generally, I'm, I'm not going to look for, I'm not going to go on the street and go, oh, my quota, you'll do, granddad. You're in my clinic, you'll do. <laughs> and uh, put two year old Johnny or I'm doing there, whatever. No, what I'm going to do is say, you're wearing a big death maiden. Whatever the hell it is, t shirt. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't know. Uh, yeah, um, that kind of thing. Uh, you look like, you know, you look like the kind of um, uh, person to me. <laughs> Death Maiden, it's a new, it's a new band. Uh, obviously, you've not heard about it. <laughs> so, that kind of thing. Yeah? Or I might be looking for, so I'm looking for festival goers. So, I'm looking for all those guys with the uh, dangly festival doohickeys that they've got. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They are. So, yeah. Cream fields and dangly festival things. So, that's why I'm, so I'm thinking, you look like, I, if I want to know about festivals, you're more likely than my dad. So, that's, that's my judgment. Yeah, how does that apply to someone who's actually on a clipboard as a job rather than uh, having expertise or looking for that sample? Well, most people who are on a clipboard and um, don't have the expertise, and so generally they are um, they're going to be told the quota they need to get of the different demographic breakdown of the people they need to get, and they'll just have to fill fill that with you know, oh yeah, this this one, this person fills that quota kind of thing. So it doesn't matter for them though if they get. 20 guys straight away, and then they get 20 women spaced over the, the next day, the next, you know, eight hours. That might be the wrong demographic because you're getting all the guys in the morning who are going to work in the city gents or something, and it might be you're getting all the, I don't know, what, <coughs> uh, kind of, uh, you know, different kinds of people. You might be getting, so, you know, there's problems in that as well because you're not telling, you're not being told when to sample, the order in which to sample, etc. Well, that's, but they can't do everything. It should just come out. Theoretically, it comes out in the wash. So if you have more people who are doing the, with clipboards, more people doing the experiments, then you know, that, that also means that you have different choices. People make different choices. Okay. The reason why this question marks are here is because there wasn't a label in my original LaTeX file for these notes that I've given you out, and now I've put a label in, and that's supposed to generate, but I've not regenerated it. Anyway, there we are. So, these are the different kinds of tests we can do. Single group post test, what do we think that means? It's easy, it's all in the words. What do those words mean? One group of people and we ask them after the test has been done. No, we ask them after the intervention has been, been created. Yeah. So we have the thing, the device, we haven't asked anything beforehand. We ask, this, we ask the single group after. They've had no more experience of that device or interface. This is the first time they've seen it. 
It's after it's been created. Okay? <coughs> then we have single group, pre-test and post-test. What do you think that is? Tell me something about, more about the intervention. What are before they going to be doing? Before they've heard about the intervention. Huh? Before they've heard about the intervention at all and then after. Well, yeah. Yes, I mean, it can happen in two ways. You can have it where it's before and after the intervention, or you can have it that's before and after you have. Oh, I didn't realize. You have changed the stimulus, done something to the independent variable. So you might have the same interface, they see it first, and then you make one change on that interface, which is a new color or something. And then you show it to them again and see whether that makes a difference, because then you can then say it's just this one thing that's changed in that one interface. If you're showing a system and then you're showing another system, there's too many confounding variables that are often likely to be in there. Yeah? Okay. Natural control group for test post test. So this one gets around this where we've got this big system. So we've got a control group which might be used to the old system. It's the control. And then we've got pre and post test for a new system that we put in. And we can compare the pre test and the post test to the new system to the control group. <coughs> so therefore we've got a baseline control group. And this is naturally occurring, which means that it's really just like anybody who fetches up. Yeah? So it's just like you guys, a naturally occurring control group for Blackboard, because you've used it, you know, because you, you're students and, that's, and, you're, and you'd be the people who use it. The randomized control group is better because this control group here means that you've got. Um, uh, a randomized sample in the control group. It's just not naturally occurring. So I look uh, for everybody in the population and just randomly pick them normally like the random sample to make the control group. Yeah? Now, this goes in a hierarchy from not so good down to good. Very good. Yeah? So it gets stronger. You've got this other thing within subjects. Participants. Within subjects. Okay? So this within subjects trial means that, that this pre-test and this post-test could be different people. Okay? Between subjects it could be. But this within subjects means it's the same people. Yeah? And then you've got others. I'm not going to get into the others. Okay? There's plenty of other types of, types of um, experiments that are there to try and get over confounding variables. Okay? Different, different makeups of different kinds of popula populations or um, samples, yeah? participants. Okay. Good. We're nearly, we're nearly there. Practical ethical processes. Why do we care about ethics? Your yes. <laughs> yes. I know. That's a, right. Why do we care about ethics? Because we don't yell at we don't have people yell at us, that's a good thing, yes, that's one, but why else? Because you end up skewing results if you uh, annoy a certain group or something. If you annoy a certain group, kind of. That's one way of seeing it. Um, any others? Yes? I, I think it's very subjective. It is in, in subjective, even within the person who is uh, maybe ethical and not ethical in anything. And that's sort of the basis of what I like is ethics, or what I don't like is not non-ethical. Kind of, well, I'm not sure about that. Anymore. Okay, so generally with ethics you've got two things. You <coughs> want to make sure that you don't screw up the participants, and you might to make sure that you don't screw up the experimenters. Okay? Those are the things that we're bothered about. And the way that, I mean, that's the, simple, that's the simplest way you can do it. And the, the reason, one of the reasons why we talk about this is that we want good science because generally if you're putting people through various trials, you want to make sure that the scientific method is correct so you don't have to keep doing it again when you realise you've corrected, collected data that's now worthless. Yeah? <clears throat> it's important, maybe it's not so much important for you guys doing UX, 
But it is important for lots of other things. And the reason why it's important is because back in the old days, people were called subjects, okay? Because experimenters were normally from higher class backgrounds, and they thought everybody was pretty much for them to use as they liked. Okay? So that's why they were called subjects. There was a direct power dynamic. The problem is, with subjects, that subjects just tell you what you want to hear. So, of course, it skews your data too. The other point is that lots of really, really crap things were done in the name of science in the past. Okay? Lots and lots. From the decapitation of Aboriginal heads uh, and the removal of uh, those kind of artefacts so we could study them better um, without any ethical discussion, we could do people like um, Burke and Hare, uh, sort of uh, digging up coffins with people in them so we could do some scientific experiments. Um, down to um, uh, the human experimentation um, uh, project, it was called in Nazi Germany, where people had no, um, you know, no prisoners or people in general had no input into what was going to happen to them, and it was normally bad. Well, it was always bad, okay, and painful. So, after the really after the Second World War and through the through the fifties, there was this move to understand. You know, people were shocked. By, this, uh, by the, the um, traits of the, uh, if you like, of the, of the um, mainly of the uh, Nazis in um, Nazi Germany. Reality is, though, everybody was doing it. The UK, you know, England was doing it in the colonies. They did it previously. You know, everybody was to blame. It wasn't just. It's just that these guys we could, you know, we could vilify pretty much because we would theoretically. <laughs> that's pretty much the way it was, you know. So that's that's one of the main problems. Now, in America. Um, the, they found that also there was lots of people, especially in mental asylums or people who were, um, had very uh, had difficulties anyway, sort of mental difficulties, who were being taken advantage of too. Um, and so the, there was a, an accord created, um, and ethics are in constant change. Okay? So the American Psychological Association had its own set of ethics. Um, there's a number of various international accords which are, which are protections to make sure that we don't screw it up again. Or at least we don't screw it up as bad as we did again. Yeah? So that's why it's there. So these checks and balances that are there are so that we can make sure that we're not taking advantage of people and so that we're not, we can make sure that we're not taking advantage of the people who are doing the experimentation either. That their, that their um, needs are met as well. And the first thing is, it's got to be good science. Okay? So generally, if it's not good science, there's no point in doing it. There's no, because you're going to get bad data. So therefore, why are you putting people through this? Okay? Now, there, is, there are times when harm to a subject, to a participant, can happen. Um, medical trials or clinical trials, when, when one subject group or one, one more participant group is getting a placebo against another in a trial where they're not getting the placebo, then it's seen that the benefits of the possible cure outweigh the possible negative effects to, the, to that participant group. But the point is, as soon as we can see statistically that there is, it's, this is mitigated by the fact that as soon as we can see statistically that there is a problem, that there is, say, a benefit to taking this other, dr this other drug and not the placebo, everybody on the placebo group is switched onto the drug immediately. Okay? The problem is that some of those people may have very well died by that point because they were given the placebo. So, but the, the, the possibility of there being a better outcome for the general population is much higher. I'm just trying to give you a background for why it's there. And the fact that it's okay to be complacent about it sometimes. We're why do we need it? We're user experience, we're UXs, we don't care. But you never know. So especially in a sort of a student situation, or maybe you've got, when you're in a work situation, you've got people who maybe are, um, look up to you or, um, uh, lower down the power hierarchy, if you like, in an organisation, they're going to be more likely to do the things that you want them to do, even though it might be against their best wish, against their best um, interests. Okay. Okay. So the way that we get around this is okay. So the, here's the, the, these are some of the various things you can see them for some of the um, declarations and some of the accords. You can see them in the notes. The main one, the real one, is this um, Declaration of Helsinki. Okay, so that's a bigger that's that's one of the big sort of um, declarations which really <coughs> might be well for the rest. But one of the ones that's mainly used as well is the American Psychological Association, especially for your kind of UX work. Okay? 
Okay? So this is the kind of thing. You also see if you're writing technical reports or papers, they'll want to see not, not, the, not just the um, ethics, but they'll want to see the um, full write-up in American Psychological Association format, which specifies how you write the number of participants, how you write the methodology, how you write, how you got them, how you disseminate the data. So. Okay. So in brief, we're looking at some things. Competence. So first of all, we want to check, are you competent to do the work? Okay. If you're not competent to do the work, then you shouldn't be doing the work because we're going to get bad scientific data and you might screw somebody up. Yeah? That's the first thing. Integrity. Have no axe, axe to grind or desired outcome. It sounds good. Everybody has an axe to grind and everybody has a desired outcome, really. You're all going to get that in, the, in a job situation due to the fact that people want this thing to work. Okay? They want you to say it's great. You're under a lot of pressure. You won't realise how much pressure you or will be under if you're in a UX environment. Because everybody, the software engineers, have wrote the best code and it's brilliant. Everybody else has done brilliant jobs. They, everybody's ready to release it. And you're going to tell them that it's not a pile of crap. <laughs> like somebody should have told them on the way up. Give them away. But anyway. Um, there we go. So that's the problem. Yeah? Follow the scientific method. Following the scientific method means that we're going to have good science, which means that we won't have to put people through this again. Yeah, that's the major thing. We won't have to do the experiment again. It also means that the results will be correct, and if the results are correct, everybody will be happy because the product, when it gets released, will be a great success, theoretically. Okay, or it won't be the user experience that screwed it up. Yeah? Okay. Respect. So you need to respect your participants. So make sure that they're capable of self-determination. Of, um, self make sure that they can agree, that they know that they've got the, the mental faculties to be able to understand what's going to happen to them, and that they're able to agree. Okay? You are trying to make sure that they, their welfare is, is paramount within the particular framework okay? that you're actually going to enact. Yeah? Benefits. You're trying to maximise benefits to people. What happened in the old days is that, for instance, the, uh, uh, a, um, an experiment had been active, but the people who would benefit wouldn't be the people who were being experimented on. It would be the rich people who could afford the procedure if it worked. Okay? Or they could afford this, or whatever it might be if it worked. Normally, the people at the bottom of the tree were the people who were actually experimented on. The, beneficiary, the benefits of that work and their, if you like, payment were the people higher up the tree. What you need to do is maximise these benefits to the people who you are working with. So, for instance, um, ethical approval for, say, I don't know, contact lenses. You know, if the people are going to suffer from problems with eyesight for while doing these uh, contact lens um, experiments, then they their benefits are going to be very low. Okay, and it's not a it's not a it's then weighed up against that it's not a life-threatening condition. <coughs> so why should somebody else benefit when the people, when the participants themselves won't? Um, justice. Undertaking with participants will benefit from the results of that research. Okay, so make sure that we're trying to make sure that, that they will benefit from the results of that research. In theory, they might not all want to use your interface or your device, but they have the option to use your interface or device. That's the point. Yes. No, just looking at this benefits and justice, does that, wouldn't that skew the data and uh, allow the biasness in how we're choosing our sample? No, because we're choosing them, we're choosing the sample randomly, say, but we're making sure that there's ethical questions, in, we've asked ourselves ethical questions in place so that we don't screw up the random sample that we've actually taken. So therefore, if the people who are in our random sample aren't going to benefit from it in the whole, then we have to, have to ask ourselves, why did we choose them? They are, if they're not going to benefit, they're not the population, are they? So why are they here? Yeah? Okay, trust. We need to maintain trust by anonymity. That's a big thing in any ethics. You need to maintain <coughs> anonymity. Confidentiality is also a big one. Um, we do, well, we didn't do, but, you know, I've seen work where people have been going to um, the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, looking to see how, um, strangely, um, uh, theatre uh, uh, increased people's well-being or a sense of community. Um, 
But of course, they have to anonymize the data. They have to make sure it's confidential. So then they're, they're putting it on an on a encrypted drive. But then also, they have to say to their participants, to maintain trust, if we get arrested, we're going to hand over this and tell them the password. Okay, so if it's, anybody, if it's anybody else, we're not telling them anything. But if it's the police, or the secret service, or whatever it might be, then we'll hand over the drive and tell them the password. And it's up to you, it's up to them, it's up to those people then, to decide whether they want to participate, or whether they want to withdraw. Okay. Okay. You have a duty of care, not just to the people who are doing it, but to yourselves. Okay? Lone worker agreement. Don't worry, we'll be doing it. Lone worker agreement. <laughs> Lone worker agreement is something that we also have. So, for instance, if you're going into a situation whereby um, you're going to be, you're on your own, you're going to go and meet um, somebody you're interviewing, say, say on their premises, behind closed doors, then there needs to be things called lone worker agreements arranged so that you can make sure you call in, that you don't get, um, you know, you're not put in harm's way yourself as an experiment, as you exit. Um, you, may, you might, you know, we also put into place um, checks and balances or, or, or systems whereby if you experience violence, you can get back up if, for instance, um, you listen to some harrowing stories, then those harrowing stories might really um, screw you up and you might need additional help. And so those things, we also have to make sure are in place that there's, there's, that there's, you know, there's, there's, some, there's some place for those. Um, okay. Well, wow, really, that's good. All right, so generally, we're now moving on to the discussion topic, the coursework for now. Somebody wrote me and said about the Wednesday, about yesterday's lecture, well, the handing date's the 2nd of May. Who wrote who? Somebody said it was the 2nd of May, but it's not. It's the 18th of April for tomorrow's. And this one, today's, is the 2nd of May. So generally... I am confused. Um, yeah, so generally, yesterday, discussion topic 3, 18th of April... Discussion topic four, which which should be because obviously we should be having this lecture after Easter, is the second of May. Okay, we'll get them in as quick as you like. Yeah. Okay. Pop quiz for the next logical week. I'm happy to say that because there's not that many of you here, this pop quiz will mean that you will look like stunning gods if you guys <laughs> to do not turn up. Um. Yeah. <coughs> This intro, you should, you should look, concentrate on these eth eight ethical key principles. What are these ethical principles that we're trying to look at? We don't need to know everything in detail. It's not the point to remember. You'll see in the notes it goes on and on. And in the appendices to the notes it goes on and on. It's to give you a, that's to give you a full understanding. All we want to know generally is when you're doing these things, what kind of things do you have to keep in mind? If you're good people, if you want to do a good job, you'll keep these in mind. And it'll just work out all right. They're very obvious. Okay. Okay. Read the voice loops by next time. It's ten percent. It's the last one. Discussion topics. Read your notes to the end of the self-assessment questions on page two thirty-nine. If you're lucky, well, if you're really going for it, read those. Uh, read the next set of notes for lecture ten. Um, that you should, which you should have had. Has anybody got not got any of these notes? Because I've got them with me. Um, Okay, so we can get those at the end. Um, there's quite a few notes, so don't uh, freak out. Um, okay, so I'm done. <coughs> and, uh, have a good uh, Easter. And uh, I shall uh, see you after Easter. Okay, good notes.
Declaration of um, Human Rights, 